Hello everybody, today I want to talk about the latest QNAP vulnerability, what it is, the severity of the impact, and what you should do to protect yourself. You may have already heard that there's another vulnerability discovered in the QNAP operating system, which affects QTS 5.0.1 and QUTS 5.0.1. If you haven't heard, let's discuss what it is, how it impacts you, and what you should do before this vulnerability gets exploited. Before we get into the detail, I did want to clarify that at the time of this video, I'm not sponsored by either QNAP or Synology. Everything we talk about today is based on my own opinions and my own experiences. As a point of reference, at work I have 16 Synology units, and I have 4 QNAP units at home along with an expansion unit. So I believe I'm approaching this from a fairly unbiased perspective. To better understand the importance, QNAP assigned a CVE score of 9.8 out of 10 for this vulnerability as it allows threat actors to inject malicious code into your device without any user input, which puts any internet-facing device at extreme risk. Given that there are approximately 30,000 QNAPs facing the public internet, many of which are currently unpatched, this may become a real issue to, to many users if the units are not patched or configured correctly. As of this video, this vulnerability had not yet been exploited, so it's critical that you patch your device as quickly as possible. When you hear numbers like 30,000, it's very concerning to me that there are so many devices facing the public internet. Because in my opinion, 99% of the users should never have their NAS units face the internet. It doesn't matter what type of device you're using unless you know exactly how to configure security such as VLANs, firewalls, and understand how to segregate your device for a specific purpose, you should avoid connecting any NAS so that it's exposed directly to the internet, whether it's a Synology, Unraid, TrueNAS, or a QNAP. Your storage device contains critical data and it should be isolated and secured so it's not a target for malicious code. At the time of this video, only two or three percent of the 30,000 had been patched, so to me the real question that we need to be asking is why are there so many devices facing the internet in the first place and why are there so many devices that remain unpatched? As tech sites and media tend to jump on QNAP more than other providers, let's take a quick look at the past six months of vulnerabilities and fixes for each company. As you can see, both companies get a similar amount of issues varying in severities, and both companies address them in a timely manner. Though in the past, QNAP didn't respond as quickly as it should, it appears that recently they have taken security a little bit more serious and have even now begun offering a bug bounty program which is definitely going to help in stepping up their game and raising the public confidence. That said, this brings us to configurations. People configure their NAS units to, to make the most out of their devices, which is completely understandable. But often we proceed without knowing anything about how a feature works and end up enabling things like services, ports, and port forwards that could be dangerous. Though this isn't necessarily the user's fault, in today's environment, we as users have to take some of the responsibility and do a bit of research so we can be more cautious on how things are configured. Don't let anybody tell you that one brand is much better than the other as any manufacturer of a device is vulnerable if you misconfigure it or if it's on a network that itself is misconfigured, allowing your NAS to be reachable irrespective of the brand. In my opinion, you won't go wrong with either brand, but arguably Synology is a bit easier on the initial setup but on the downside, you'll give up some of the hardware specs and pay a little bit more for the device. As for me, I'm going to stick with the QNAP for my home use as I don't expose any of them to the internet and the hardware has been extremely good. That said, let's go over some of the key settings and some of my recommendations in securing the device. In my opinion, the most important place to start is my QNAP Cloud. As this software is designed to connect your device online, so that it can be accessed when you're away from your network, by definition is one of the weakest links. So in my opinion, you shouldn't be using it, and it should be disabled like the one that you see on my screen. We'll talk later about some alternatives that you can use to accomplish the same thing much more securely. Next is a bit obvious, but let's make sure that you install all the app and OS updates. You can do this by going to the control panel, selecting firmware, and selecting check for updates and update to the latest version if you haven't already done so. The one thing I would also do though is verify the latest version you've installed matches the latest version on their website. 
Earlier versions of QNAP vulnerability blocked the process of checking for auto updates, so it showed you current when you really weren't. So manually check it just to be sure that you are on the latest. And lastly, though this is a personal preference, my suggestion is that you enable automatic updates that will allow you at a minimum to, do, to notify you. Personally, I just prefer to have everything updated. With the amount of stuff that we're adding to our networks, this is just one less management task, but it's a critical one that these devices stay updated and patched. Next, let's open up the control panel, go under General Settings, System Admin Settings, and let's make sure that we're set up for best practice. In the System Ports section, make sure you change your default port to another port. Remember that when you change this, you'll need to add that port number to your IP address in the browser to access the web interface of your NAS. In other words, if your NAS IP address is 192.168.1.10, you'll need to do 192.168.1.10 colon and then the new port number. The other settings stay roughly the same as what you see on my screen. You can disable HTTP compression, that's really not needed anymore. And enable connection, secure connection HTTPS and set the version to at least 1.2 or later. The rest can be left at default. I would also probably change the server name just to make it a little bit more challenging, but that's totally up to you. Next, let's go to the security tab and enable two-step verification for the admin accounts. Remember that when you set up using an authenticator app, you need to make sure that the, your authenticator app, if it doesn't uh, sync through the cloud to other devices, that you set up multiple devices when you're setting this up. Or you never want the two-factor authentication to be set up on only one device, because if something happens to that device, you won't be able to get in. Though not technically needed for security, back up your settings is just a great idea, and it can save you in the event of misconfiguration or future issues. So I would go ahead and just back up that file and it'll create a configuration file that you can just store somewhere that preferably not on the NAS. In the privilege tab is where you make a new admin account if you're still using the default. New configurations force you to create a different admin account when you do a setup. But if you had your device for a while and you shut off the reminder like I did, um, you still may be using the default account. So you really should create a new admin account. Once you create it, and when you know everything is working correctly, you can disable the original admin account. So you never want to use the default admin account. Using default credentials is similar to default ports. If you change them, it just makes it harder to brute force the device if somebody were to gain access to it. Under Network and File Services, you should only enable what you need. In my case, I enable Microsoft Networking, but I disable Apple, and NFS, and definitely WebDAV. Obviously, your needs may vary, but the rule here is if you don't need it, then don't turn it on. Under Telnet and SSH, these should be disabled unless you have a very specific use case and you're familiar with the risk. Most users should not enable these options. Under Service Discovery, both of these tabs should be off unless you have a specific need for these. Device Discovery is convenient and allows your NAS to be uh, immediately found when you're browsing your network, but it's not necessary. It's better to disable it and you have, unless you have a really specific need. If yours is on, disable it and see if it causes you any issues. In this next section, I'm not going to go through every application on this list, but you need to use some caution here. In my opinion, the web server, LDAP server, Radius server, TFTP, NTP servers should all be disabled as they're not used in normal conditions. There are some third-party apps that will force you to enable these. If you run across these apps, I would question whether or not you really want to use it. The one app you definitely want to turn on is Antivirus. This one is critical and helps you scan your current files. And if you're like me and you store stuff for a long time, it can also help you identify older files that haven't been used in many years that may actually contain some malicious code. I know that I've found more than a few old software files that I had not used in years that contains suspicious code that were flagged as having malicious code, which I chose to delete rather than take a chance. In addition, make sure you set up a job scan so that you routinely run this thing to keep it safe. Now let me explain why this app is arguably the most important. As with any device, vulnerabilities are only an issue if the device is reachable and gets attacked. However, attacks do not always come straight in and can often come from a vulnerability in another device such as an IP camera, an old router, an unpatched system. 
For example, let's assume your device is set up correctly and you've done everything right and the device isn't connected to the internet, though you're much less likely to have a problem given that you've done all the best practices. The possibility still exists that an attack can come from somewhere else in your network but outside of the device. For that reason, Q-Firewall is your last line of defense to protect your valuable data. It works similar to a traditional firewall except that it only protects your NAS. You set up some simple rules on what devices or networks are allowed to access it while other things are blocked. One of the earlier complaints that I used to have personally and certainly heard about on, on the comments was the earlier versions of the software issued a lot of false positives. In the early versions of the software, excessive false positives would saturate your notifications, sometimes with thousands of events. However, in recent versions, things have stabilized quite a bit, and I haven't seen that condition come up. The big issue with this is that people are turning off Q-Firewall because they were getting too many notifications thinking it was the NAS. Now, one important thing to keep in mind is that Q-Firewall is flagging hits going to the NAS, not from the NAS. So all it's really doing is showing up a potential issue that you have somewhere else in your network. Network. Though you may never see it depending on your network and configuration and the devices that you've attached, if it does happen, it's telling you to look at your network and see if something else is going on and try to isolate these events that are coming in. They may have been there for a long time and you just didn't know it until you put something like this in place and it starts flagging events. So the temptation to blame QNAP for this probably is invalid. It's only flagging what it's seeing coming in. I've done a couple of videos that describe how to configure it and set it up, and I'll post those in the description below. The last application I want to cover is the hybrid backup sync, which you should absolutely do no matter how tight your setup is and your security, as it always protects you from hardware failure in addition to any possible data corruption. I'll post some links to de detailed videos on how I set mine up in the description below, should you want more information on the topic. The last thing is not really limited to QNAP, but rather a general network configuration. Look closely at your router configuration for any UPnP settings and definitely disable those, as well as take a clo close look at any of the ports that you've forwarded from your NAS and try and stop them if you see what happens. Direct port forwards are dangerous, especially if they are the default ports. If you really need to have a port forward, and make sure that it's a secure connection service that you're using and that you're not using the default ports. For example, something like OpenVPN or Plex has to have a port forward to work outside the network. But alternatively, if you want to access your NAS directly, then consider a VPN such as Tailscale or OpenVPN as your best solution. Well, that's about it for today's video. And I'll post some links to other videos on topics we covered today for more information on these features, such as Q-Firewall, HBS3, OpenVPN, and Tailscale. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.